All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Brandi Keller with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Thank you for joining us for our fifth week in July of our Homegrown Lecture Series. Uh, we, we had an extra long one, so we're gifted with Paul Winsky twice this month. Um, and even better, we get to have him again next week for Earth Kind Landscaping, so that he's gonna kick off our August Homegrown Series. Uh, you may have noticed that things look a little bit different today, and we have, uh, it's still Teams, but it's Teams Live, so the interaction is going to be a little bit different, uh, but it should be able to stream a whole lot better and uh, with no interruptions or muting or videos. So uh, we have Paul Winsky, the county horticulture agent in Harris County uh, right now. Welcome, Paul. Okay, thank you, Brandy. Uh, yes, I, I hope you guys are enjoying uh, this newer format. The other big uh, plus will be that um, we ran into some issues with uh, filling up teams before, having more people than we can handle, and now that will no longer be an issue. Uh, so uh, as Brandy said, uh, you can see here on our homegrown uh, lecture series, uh, the image. Um, Next week will be Earthkind Landscape Practices, which will then be followed by Shannon Dietz and the Home Lawn Maintenance and Care Part 2. Uh, Kim Perry on the 20th will be talking about focusing on fall vegetable variety. So if you remember last week, last month or this month, uh, she actually talked about getting prepared, preparing your, your beds and your garden for fall vegetables. Uh, now she's going to go more in depth with the varieties uh, that you should be looking at. And then to round out uh, the month of August, uh, Brandy's going to be presenting elements of landscape design. So let's see. Um, here we go. Oh, wait a minute. Minor problem here. Hold on. Where did my all right? Some minor technical difficulties. Hang in there. Okay. Are you seeing a uh, homegrown lecture series again? All right, so let me. OK, why is that not doing that? Blair, any reason why? I would be running into issues here. Content my desktop. OK. OK, why is it going to a black screen? This worked when we were checking it out before. Hang in there. Desktop. We had no problems when we went through the rehearsal the other day. So hang in there. We should get this going. So there's the content. It should be live, right? Um, oh, we lost Blair. All right, folks, hang in there. Uh, are you seeing the homegrown lecture series? Kim or Brandy? We can see, we can see yes, the flyer. Yeah. Okay, you can see the flyer. All right, so if I click, let me try just enter. Oh. You still see the flyer? No. No, we no. see you. Okay. Right. And you're seeing the flyer again, correct? Correct. OK, hold on. Did 
There we go, Paul. Okay, but I, I think that's on Blair's and that he's got he's got a copy of my presentation. Okay. So, um, yeah. Ten. All right. Uh, <laughs> hang in there, folks. Uh, we're we're learning to uh, to walk here. And as soon as I we get this up and running, we should be good to go. Um, so Blair, are we good? I'm seeing it on the right hand screen here. Um, so I, I guess this is how I'm going to see it on my end is what I am assuming. OK, so we are going to talk about landscape grasses, uh, ornamental grasses for the landscape. Uh, so if we can go next slide, please. If we're going to work that way. OK, so why ornamental grasses? Um, you know, in the past, I believe they were overlooked. Um, and they. Um, uh, mainly because there weren't a lot of them out there, and I think honestly a lot of gardeners and even landscapers weren't sure how to use them. Uh, and so they may have been overlooked in the past. Uh, they do provide unique foliage and flowers uh, throughout the season, so a lot of these are either summer bloomers or fall bloomers, uh, and they carry that what we call that seasonal interest um, throughout the growing year. OK, uh, next slide, please. So they are adaptable uh, and that is uh, key. Uh, they are easy to grow. So the image that you see here on the left hand side, that is a bioswale. Uh, and these ornamental grasses work well with the perennials. Uh, that is an embankment, both and both sides. Uh, the, the side on the right is a bit more steeper. Um, and um, it will um, keep that from eroding. Uh, on the on the uh, the plants uh, right in front of us, there's there's a slight decline, but these plants work extremely well in bioswales. The image in the middle, uh, we can see there, um, it is a um, green roof. Uh, so these uh, ornamental grasses do an extremely good job at working in, uh, as a green roof. So they'll help with water filtration. Uh, they'll help with those heat islands that are always associated uh, with um, the uh, inner city areas. Uh, so they do an extremely good job of absorbing that heat. And then the image on the right hand side, uh, we can see uh, the issue where they're using it uh, more as a conventional means. Um, you know, we've got this bright contrasting uh, golden grass uh, and you've got Nandinas and so they've just using it to uh, line out that walkway. OK, next slide, please. So uh, ornamental grasses is sort of that catch all phrase, OK, and it's really these grasses and grass like plants come from three families. So um, we've got the grass family, which is Poaceae, and you can see that with the larger image here of the Penicetum. Um, you've got the rush family, uh, which is Junkaceae, and that's the uh, image in the upper right side. And, and so that's going to they're going to like wet feet. Um, they're going to like mo moister soils. And then you've got the sedge family, which uh, Cyperiaceae, uh, and, and they they also um, they're going to like. Uh, they can mo uh, handle the wet feet, um, but and they're also going to do well uh, in uh, semi shaded areas. OK, next slide. OK, so uses so they 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 are diverse. Um, uh, we can use them as specimens, so uh, some of these grasses uh, work well just as a standalone plant. Um, other ones you can grow. Uh, you could use them just like you would in an, like an annual. Uh, you can put groups of them down. Um, so a very low maintenance once they're established. Uh, larger types, we can even use them as screening. So some of these varieties can reach up over eight feet tall. So if you've got an area that you uh, want some privacy, um, you can use these plants 
in that way. Uh, and the great thing about it is with them being as, you know, dynamic as they are, how they would move uh, out and about with with regard to the, the breeze and the wind, um, it, it really gives a, a cha changing look to the landscape. Uh, and they work well uh, on slopes and, and eroded areas, so uh, it will help keep that soil in place. And the diversity is, is really due to their growth habits. So we've got ground cover types, we've got intermediate shrub-like types, and then we've got the tall ones. And the, the other interesting thing is as these plants grow throughout the season, um, you will see them, uh, they might, when they first emerge, uh, say you've got a one that's going to top out at four to six feet or so, it's going to have an upright habit. Uh, and then it's going to change as it starts to grow and there's more foliage. It's going to look more like a vase shape. Uh, and then as those flower plumes come on, it's going to have that shrub look. So it's going to have more of a rounded look with the flowers above it. So it's rather interesting to see how these plants change in the landscape. And that's what you want. You always want interest in that landscape uh, in order to keep you coming in and, uh, you know, depending where you have it uh, for people to enjoy. So next slide, please. So what are the benefits? Um, low maintenance. Any gardener here in Texas, um, you know, if you don't have to be out in that heat um, and it's and the plant's going to perform well, um, that's the main thing we are looking for. The, the biggest um, job you're going to have to do with these and you're going to have is you will need to prune them. And the pruning is usually done late winter uh, before the new growth. So in our area, we're looking the end of February, probably into the first half of March, maybe in through March. So uh, and it's not bad to be working outside then. So um, pruning is probably the biggest task. Very low fertilizer inputs. Uh, and normally this is in the springtime, you, you um, supply it before the new growth appears. So if you've got a specimen, a clump type, we recommend 10-10-10 at uh, one to one and a half cups per plant sprinkled around the, the uh, outside of the plant, around the edges. Uh, a lot of people will do this after they prune. So if you prune beginning of March, you can put your fertilizer out and you're done for the season. If you've got them uh, as a ground cover type, uh, we recommend two to three pounds of that 10, 10, 10 per hundred square feet. So uh, low maintenance, low fertilizer input, and once they're established, a lot of them are very drought tolerant. So um, they're very good plants to have in that landscape. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as we talked about broad environmental conditions, these plants are heat and drought tolerant. Um, if you've got a pond, if you've got um, any kind of wet area, um, they do well. Um, certain ones do well in boggy wet areas. If you've got a coastal property, these plants will hold up very well, especially under salty conditions. And majority of them really do perform extremely well in full sun. Um, one of the other advantages, there's very few insects and diseases that these uh, ornamental grasses will get. Um, might get a little rust here and there. You might see a little bit of uh, insect damage, but in the long run, um, very low maintenance, uh, very few issues. Uh, and they establish quite easily. Um, you, you know, down here, you can establish plants just about any time of the year. Um, I always like to do either, um, you know, uh, early spring, late winter, uh, let them, or even in the fall, let those roots get established. Um, and then once the growing season comes, um, they are up and ready to go. Uh, and then the other value added is that food source and nesting habitat. So, you know, we always want to bring beneficials. We want to bring interesting wildlife in. And so certain birds will come in uh, and, and work within these uh, ornamental grasses. So there's something a little extra, not only its unique habit and form, um, but also some of the uh, good wildlife that you can bring in uh, to your garden. Next slide. All right, so pruning. Uh, how do you prune? When do you prune again? We said about late winter, so end of February, beginning of March, maybe through March before new growth starts. Uh, you can see the, the, the images, the three images across the bottom. Here's more of a taller upright. Uh, so the easiest way to do that would be to tie it off. Uh, and then you can just come in with some hedge pruners 
uh, and prune it again about six to eight inches. If it's a taller plant, maybe it's a foot tops, um, but I wouldn't be, you know, much, much taller than that. And you definitely don't want to, you know, scalp it like you would with um, your turf. You don't want to cut it where you just have uh, a half inch or two inch stubs. Six to eight inches will be fine. And at that time of year, you could then go ahead and, you know, put out your fertilizer and you're done with it. Um, once the temperature's warm, the soil warms up, uh, these ornamental grasses will wake up and start to uh, grow for you. Next slide. So when considering ornamental grasses, consider the same things as when you're choosing your trees or you're choosing your shrubs or you're choosing your perennials or annuals. Um, what growth form are you looking for? Upright? Um, do you want that sort of vase shape? Do you want a, it, to, it to have a cascading look? Um, what is the mature size? So knowing where it is in your um, landscape bed or in, in that garden, is it, is it a, a spot that I want an ornamental grass towards the front or is it something that I want to anchor that landscape and I want to put it towards the back and I want something that's going to make a bold statement. So we're looking at something a little bit taller. Um, these grasses, some are evergreen, some are deciduous, so be aware of that. But even the deciduous ones, you know, they're, they're the ones that you have to prune even through the winter. Um, you know, you can leave those uh, until you prune them. You'll have interest there in that garden. So um, they, they perform extremely well. Foliage color can be all over the place, and we'll take a look at that uh, here shortly. And along with the time of flower, so flowers, some of them are summer flowers, uh, some of them are fall. So you can uh, really stage these out in your landscape to have interest uh, throughout the growing season, along with your other plants uh, that you've got in your landscape. Next slide. So here's just a brief uh, idea, you know, a concept of what the foliage can be. So we we oh we, we know there's a lot of irrigation. So the two images uh, on the left hand side, we've got the typical uh, linear variegation, uh, linear variegation, uh, gold and white uh, with the green, um, and then but you. With some of these ornamental grasses, we've got banded variegation where it goes uh, horizontally across, which is really unique and, and a different concept. Of course, we've got the green and, and we've got a nice uh, uh, arching uh, uh, presentation there. But then the last one on the right, you know, that bold golden color. So again, whether you use them in the landscape, I see people using ornamental grasses now in their combination planters. It's a very versatile plant that you can use uh, across a lot of different uh, needs in the landscape or in combinations. Next slide, please. Also with the flowers. So you can see how these present um, in the landscape and in your garden. So you can have seed, seeds and flowers that are nodding, that are held upright. Um, second one on your uh, left, it, it's got that bo bottle brush look. Uh, and then the flower on the right, it's sort of like that feather duster look. So, and you can just, you know, imagine um, as a breeze is coming through how these are going to look uh, and that dynamic uh, look that these plants are going to bring to your landscape as opposed to a, uh, a woody shrub or a tree that maybe isn't going to move as much uh, and isn't going to be able to uh, provide that interest um, that you would see with these ornamental grasses. Next slide. So growth forms, predominantly clumpers, all right? So, you know, we've got clumpers, we've got spreaders, and the clumpers, um, they're gonna get wider, uh, their diameter's gonna get wider over time. Um, the good thing about them is, you know, you can easily uh, propagate that, you can do divisions, and so if there's other places that you would like to move that clumper, if it's getting too big, um, you can go ahead and divide it. And then we have the spreaders. Uh, you know, these guys are going to spread more uh, like um, uh, typical St. Augustine. All right, you, they're they're going to they're going to get wider from either putting out rhizomes or stolons. Uh, and your quick botany lesson here: rhizomes are underground stems, 
and stall ends are above ground stems. And so um, they can put these out and 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 um, uh, fill in an area that way. They aren't the ones that we're talking about. They aren't overly aggressive. They aren't invasive, um, but certain ones there are varieties out there that can be, you know, that may not play as well with the other plants in the bed. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, next slide. OK, um, this is a good point um, before we get into the actual uh, varieties. So uh, Kim, are there any questions um, uh, before I move on? No questions. OK, well, great. So we will uh, continue on. Uh, let's see if it goes back to full. Here we go. So our first one is a chorus graminius or sweet flag is the common name. Now this is one that you're going to want to use in a, in a wet areas. Uh, it, it likes wet feet. Uh, so if it's a, if you got it in a full sun that dries out, uh, this is not the plant that you want to use. Uh, it, it is a low grower, uh, tops out at about four inches. Um, it works well. Think of it wherever you're using ferns, maybe where you have hydrangeas, uh, things like that. This, of course, is going to do extremely well there. Um, this is dwarf golden, so it sort of has a chartreuse look. Uh, and then there's a golden variety, which is a little bit taller, maybe about six to eight inches tall. But they have that tufted look. They soften the lines uh, and they work extremely well. Uh, in the front of the beds, uh, especially in areas that are shaded and that are on the wet side. Uh, next slide. Carrick. So here's one of our sedges. Uh, and again, this is another one. This one has an upright habit. It is evergreen. Um, part sun is, is ideal. Again, another one for moist soil. So, you know, you can tie, you can usually figure if your, your shaded areas are usually going to stay a little bit wet longer. Um, so, you know, something like Carrox would work well. Uh, they can range in height anywhere from 12 to 18 inches. The variety here that we're looking at is called Sparkler. So think about, these look like, um, mini palm trees. Uh, if you were to pull out one of those stems, uh, it would look like a palm tree or almost like if you were holding a sparkler, uh, it gives you that effect. Now there's a lot uh, new varieties that are coming out in these other species. So you can see Carex moroii, Buchanani, Oshimensis, Glauca, and Testacea. Um, these all will um, You'll, you'll see varieties out there on the market of these also. And some of their, the foliage on these are uh, extremely bold, um, very good variegation. Uh, they have a little bit different look, um, almost more of a mounding habit, not as upright uh, with the stems. But Carrick is, Carrick's, uh, they do extremely well uh, down here in our region. Um, next slide, please. Chasmanthium, latifolium, one of my favorites. Uh, inland sea oats. This this plant has a very good look. Um, it's very adaptable to sun or shade uh, or drought. Uh, this one's going to top out at about four feet, but I love the way it presents its its um, seed pods. It um, to me it reminds me of a. Uh, uh, fishing pole with uh, some fish hanging off of it. Uh, so. Um, it is really um, a good presentation. Uh, it will bloom uh, late summer. Uh, and then as it matures or as the fall comes on, those seed pods will turn uh, sort of a tannish brown color. So you've got some uh, added interest there uh, with it. So um, this one is, performs extremely well, uh, especially if you've got a beach house, this plant will do uh, very good. So uh, next slide. Dianella. So this is one of those. This is a common name is, is flax lily. This is native to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I would say these have probably grown in popularity over the last um, uh, at least 10 to 15 years. Um, upright habit, sort of that vase shaped look. Uh, it does produce a flower spike, um, little uh, light blue star shaped flowers. And then uh, the interesting thing is uh, if it's pollinated, those flowers are pollinated. It's got these turquoise blue uh, berries. Uh, so again, some uh, additional interest. Uh, work well in a full sun and a part shade. 
for the uh, Tasmanica uh, species, um, there's varieties called Tas Red, Yvea, Silver Streak. Um, but these other species I have listed, this Revoluta and Corula, um, they get into the blues and, and sort of the uh, uh, gray greens and things like that, and they have some upright habits. So um, this is one, you know, tops out at about two to three feet. So we're talking mid border. I've seen it used in the, uh, the front of a border uh, and they work well in combination planters also to sort of give you that either that filler or sometimes that um, uh, the thriller if it's depending on the plants that you're using around it. So Dianella is a, is a great plant that performs well here. Uh, next up, next slide. Equisetum. This one's got this. This has got some prehistoric look to it, uh, and it's been around, I think, at least three, three and a half billion years. They they found fossils of this. Um, you want to add height and architectural interest into the landscape. Um, uh, this is the plant, uh, and it's ideal for water areas or or very wet areas. Um, we used to, when I was in the nursery production, uh, we grew this uh, for our stock. Uh, actually in the drainage ditches uh, and then we would just go and, and lift out what we needed when we were propagating. Uh, it, this can live up to in uh, standing water up to four inches. So, you know, along a stream bed in the ponds. Uh, I've also seen it, people uh, fill a uh, decorative pot, drop that plant in it and, and put some goldfish in the bottom and that plant and then the fish do extremely well. So landscape height, this is gonna to top out at about four feet. So this is one that um, really gives you a, a great look. You see this a lot in uh, oriental type gardens, Asian gardens, um, but it is um, a really cool uh, presentation uh, as it matures when it's in the landscape. Next slide, please. Juncus. So this is one of the common rushes um, and the, the Juncus effusus uh, on the right hand side uh, is, is what we're talking about with that vase shape look uh, very structural in its in its presentation and you can see the flower pods uh, the, or, or the seed pods on it. Um, and regardless of whether it's it's that form or it's uh, at the one that you see in the first picture with that uh, corkscrew presentation, um, again, something unique, something architecturally interesting. Um, they like wet feet. Um, they do extremely well in our area. They are uh, North American natives. A lot of the, these grasses are, are North American natives, so uh, they have been here. It'll bloom in late spring. Um, the, the variety that you're seeing on the uh, uh, left hand side, that is a big twister. So you can see as the new growth comes out, uh, it, it provides that corkscrew growth. And there are varieties out there where it's even tighter and they're smaller and they got that corkscrew habit. So Juncus is really a, a fun plant to work with, whether in containers or in the landscape. Next slide, please. Liriope, we have seen liriope probably used maybe overused too much, but I just wanted to touch on it. Aztec grass or lily turf. So it's, it sort of looks like it always reminds me of day lily type foliage. Um, it is evergreen. Uh, it is tufted. So you can see uh, you can use this like a bedding plant uh, if you've got a large area that you need to cover. Um, uh, it will bloom. Uh, it will uh, produce these spikes of purplish bell shaped flowers uh, that will appear in the summer. Depending on the variety, the height is anywhere from 10 to 16 inches. Uh, and there are a lot of varieties out there. You've got green varieties. You've got uh, variegated green and white. You've got variegated green and yellow. Um, and so depending on what you are looking for and what you need, um, Liriope can, can fill that need for you. Uh, next slide. Miscanthus. Um, now we're getting into, into some of the bigger ones, uh, some of the bigger hitters here. Um, this is maiden grass is the common name, Miscanthus sinensis. Uh, it has a mounding habit, uh, does well in drought conditions. Uh, it will have winter interest because it holds, it will hold its foliage, but you will have to, um, you know, prune it back in the spring of the year. Uh, and landscape height on this can be anywhere from two and a half feet on up to eight feet. And you can see by the list of varieties there, this is Adagio uh, in this image. 
Um, but there's been a lot of breeding. There's been a lot of selection uh, of, of Miscanthus uh, here over the past few years. Uh, next slide, we'll take a look at two of the varieties. Uh, Strictus is on the uh, left, so you can see that upright and the flowers uh, heads are uh, have that sort of uh, burgundy red color. Uh, and then, uh, but on the right, you've got morning light. So this is one that has the banded variegation. So even though uh, it is not in bloom, it brings some color and interest uh, to the landscape even before it begins uh, to flower. Next slide. Now here's a, another variety. This is Gracilimus, and this is in the fall winter. So you can see how that foliage has changed, but it's it's holding those uh, almost those dried flowers above it. So um, you've got some unique interest there. Again, seasonal variations, things that you can uh, enjoy throughout that garden throughout the entire year. And then here's just variegata. So this is the linear variegation, green and white, but you sort of have a, a, a soft pink flowers above it. So you've got a really nice contrast um, with the flowers playing off that um, uh, foliage uh, that presents uh, with variegatas. Next slide, please. Uh, one of my favorites, I've uh, probably said that uh, several times here, but I really love Mullenbergia capillarius, uh, golf muley. Uh, this is a native. Uh, it's one of those, you know, we always hear those cl cliches, tough as nails, Texas tough. Um, this is one of them. And, and you can see landscapers are using it more in, in, in their designs, in entryways to uh, uh, developments, in the median strips. Um, it is heat and drought tolerant. Uh, these pink blooms in the fall, um, they just look like clouds of pink mist uh, hovering above the above the uh, the plant. It has a beautiful habit, mounding habit, about three to four feet tall. And some of the varieties that you'll find out there is white cloud, plume plume tastic, regal mist. Um, but it, it just has a a great presentation. Um, next slide. Uh, we can see uh, what white cloud looks like. And then, you know, you may see this just as pink. Um, and so you can see the flower production on it. So as these plants mature, as they get larger, you know, they will fill in more, they will pull, they will produce more flowers. Uh, and that presentation will just, you know, every year you'll get excited to see these bloom. Uh, and so if you've got one plant, it'll be wow. And if you've got more than one that are clumped together, you know, I would say, you know, at least three. Um, that flower production and that presentation is going to be even that much more uh, take your breath away type uh, look when it is in bloom. Next slide. Ophiopogon, I'm sure everybody's aware of this. Mondo grass, very uh, short clumping habit so um, the uh, one on the right is is the just the typical ophiopogon japonicus uh, it'll top out at about 12 inches um, the one in, on the uh, left hand side is nanus so very tight uh, clumping habit almost looks like cousin it in its presentation if you remember the adams family um, and there are some other varieties there's nigrescens which is has a bold, dark chocolate, almost black color to it. Uh, if you find it, um, and it and it works well, um, give it a shot. But it is a slow grower. Um, we always struggled with it in propagation uh, on the production side because it was such a slow grower. But um, when it establishes and it's in a, a, a good spot, it really uh, against a uh, gray green or silver foliage, uh, it really plop, pops in the landscape. Some other species that you'll find out there, uh, uh, Jabberin uh, is going to be even taller, you know, so we're talking about maybe 16 to 18 inches, maybe om almost reaching two feet. And then there's uh, Planescapus out there. So these uh, other species will also perform well in our area. Next slide. Panicum virgatum switchgrass, another one that um, is a very hardy plant. 
um, performs extremely well. And as you can see from the list of varieties there, there's been a lot of breeding and selection uh, that has occurred. Uh, and when it is in bloom, it produces the, it's like these clouds of uh, seed pods above it. So it, it's really great the way it's got that upright habit. And then you see this cloud of seed pods above it. Um, they will tolerate dry conditions. So, you know, if we hit drought conditions, um, a panicum, if you've got it in the landscape, will perform extremely well. So let's take a look at some of these varieties. So the next slide um, is ruby ribbons. So even before it's blooming, the tips of the foliage have this ruby red color. So you've got some interest there. And then you can see here's cloud nine and it just it does look like a cloud, right? It's a lot of the grasses you just want to walk and, and then just run your hand over them and watch them sway in the in, in the breeze. Um, but cloud cloud nine is one that uh, really has a nice presentation that white contrasts nicely against that green foliage. Next slide. Here's Shenandoah. Uh, this is a uh, one that's been around a while. Again, red foliage on the tips, um, getting ready to bloom. Um, but you can see that very, you, you know, upright habit. As it matures a little, it will open up, but it will keep that upright habit. And then on the right, we have Dallas Blue, so a, a, a white bloomer, but it's got that uh, bluish gray foliage, so a nice contrast. So, you know, the panicums are ones that perform well, uh, and they might be ones that you want to consider uh, in, the, in your landscape. And there's a lot of options. Next slide. Penicetum, allopecuroides, fountain grass. Uh, this is definitely the one that's 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 got the the bottle brush type uh, flowers, a very fine foliage, uh, excellent as either a specimen or in the border. Uh, has that fountain classic fountain shape where that foliage comes up, sort of lays over itself, and then when it blooms, those flower spikes come up through the middle. Uh, as you can see from the varieties, there's a lot of breeding and selection work that has been done. Uh, you can see the height is anywhere from 1.5 on up to six feet. So there's a lot of diversity. So you can use this in a lot of spaces uh, in the landscape, whether it's mid bed, even towards the front or towards the back part of the bed as a uh, showpiece. So let's take a look at some of the varieties for the uh, penicetums. Next slide. So you can see how well in these two pictures we've got redhead on the left and so it's got a soft pink flower and you have cassian on the white which has that white almost bunny type tail um, and uh, you can see how well these play uh, with perennials uh, just the way they sort of come up and arch over and how those flowers uh, give a, a soften the lines uh, in that bed so they perform extremely well and they play well with others uh, next slide, please. All right, now here's a different penicetum. So the, the species we talked about before was Allopecoroides. Uh, this is cetacean. Uh, this is purple fountain grass. Uh, and we see this a lot. You will we'll probably start seeing it in the stores pretty soon. This is more of a fall producer for us. Um, the flower type is the same. Uh, the growth habit, but you're going to see the, these majority are going to be that purplish maroon foliage. Uh, and these varieties can be anywhere from two to eight feet. Um, if we get an extremely cold winter, which doesn't happen that often, but if we do, um, this variety will probably take a hit, um, but most times it will come back. Um, so the, the image that we're seeing here is rubrum. Uh, and there's two varieties I want you to keep an eye out for. One is fireworks and the other one is skyrocket. And if we go to the next slide, we can see what, here's fireworks. So look how that, um, that color, that contrast. So even if it's not in bloom, you've got this almost hot red, hot pink, and it's variegated. And then when it blooms, you've got these nice soft flower heads above it. And you can see how it contrasts with that Stackies uh, Byzantina on the left. And you've got some pink in the white. So uh, and they've clumped this nicely. You know, there's four plants there, so it draws your eye to it. But the other plants are there to accent, accent that color and really make it pop. So that is fireworks. So uh, you might want to keep an eye out for that one. 
Um, our next one is uh, Penicetum, and this is a hybrid, and this is going down as um, uh, napier grass. And so this, a lot of breeding on these napier grasses have come from uh, University of Georgia. And you can see how they've got this graceful fountain-like habit, um, very dark purplish foliage. Again, you'll probably start seeing these plants come out on the market um, for the fall. Um, landscape height can be anywhere from two to eight feet. So princess uh, is probably the shortest and princess is on the uh, left hand side of the picture. And then you can see, um, I believe that's black stockings on the right. So you can see how large that plant gets. Now both princess Caroline and black stockings are Texas superstar plants. So they are, um, they've been trialed in our Texas superstar program and they have received that distinction. So um, you know that both Princess Caroline and black stockings um, will perform well. Uh, another, this is another one where if we get an extremely cold winter, these are probably gonna take a hit. They're gonna perform like an annual. Um, I've got some of the Princess Caroline at the house for part of the trial. Mine overwintered this year and they're coming back and they're, they're, they're growing extremely well. But if we get an extremely cold winter, um, the Napier grass, this, this hybrid Penicetum, and I believe it's a three-way cross that they did in order to get these, uh, this variety or these uh, varieties. Um, but they give you that, they've got that wow effect. Um, they do well in containers. Um, and so you could see, especially in the fall with mums or th something like that, uh, or asters, um, you can get some really nice color contrasts. Okay, uh, next slide. All right. So even though we had some technical difficulties, um, we got through this. I hope you uh, enjoyed that. And uh, let me open it up. Kim, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Paul, you have a couple questions. Okay, well, let's go for it. All right, so the first question is, are there grasses that will do well in the shade? Uh, yes, um, a lot of these will do well in the shade. So even, um, you know, the Penicetums, um, the Miscanthus, they will do well in the shade um, and it, it, it will, the shade, the amount of shade will affect the amount of flower production you get on that plant. So if we have, um, you know, say six hours of sun, maybe seven hours of sun, you probably won't see any uh, difference in flower production as if it was in full sun. But if you were, um, say you just get a little bit of morning sun, the plant's gonna grow well. Um, just the flower production isn't gonna be as robust as it would be um, in the full sun. Okay, next. Ready for next question? Okay, it said, uh, basically, what is a good choice for a large container paired with the fillers and the spillers? Um, you know, I, actually those, uh, the penicetums that we talked about would do extremely well. Um, so the cetaceums, uh, they've got that nice upright growth uh, and then they will, you know, flow, you know, have that vase like so so the foliage will will fall over um, and that dark foliage even when it's not in bloom um, that will be that have that wow effect you know it'll draw your eye to it so with that red you know you can go with just about any color you can go with yellows to contrast it or you can go you know monochromatic and try different reds against it um, so uh, really they will do extremely well what what i would do is just make sure you know do a little bit of research you know depending on the size of the pot you know, just make sure you're in scale. You know, you don't want an, one of these grasses that are going to get ultimately six to eight feet, but you've got a pot that is is way too small, and there's not going to be enough um, uh, room in there for that for that uh, uh, root system. So I would lean towards the Penicetum uh, cetaceums, but the other ones, if you find the right height give it a shot. It, 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 it's worth it. Don't don't be afraid um, because the, the good thing is they're, they're, that their look with these grasses um, is going to change over the season. And so uh, in that container, you're going to have a different look. Um, you know, what you saw a month ago, it's going to look a little bit different than it does now, and it'll look much different than it, than it will uh, a month from now. 
Um, so um, just be aware of the scale, you know, what that ultimate height's going to be uh, of, in that plant um, to the pot that you're going to put it in. Next question, okay. Kim. So next question uh, from Kate, it says, are there any grasses you can recommend that tend to be less likely to provoke allergies? Um, I don't know if these, gr that's a good question. I don't know about these, if you never hear, oh, the miscanthus polish, uh, pollen is high or the penicetum pollen is high. You know, when we hear about the grasses, we usually hear it's Bermuda grass, it's, it's some of the other things. Uh, and if you're mowing it, it, it shouldn't be an issue. So I, I don't know if these grasses, I'm, I'm sure there are people that have allergies and might be allergic to it. It might affect them at a certain time of the year. But, you know, we're not planting these in, you know, like a lawn. So, you know, you, you, especially in your own landscape, you might have one or two or three as a specimen or, or you clump together. So I, I don't know if the pollen count from these ornamental grasses would be high enough, but I'm sure some people are very sensitive and they, they might find it. But um, th that's a great question. Off the top of my head, I am not aware of any that are more um, heavily pollen producers that will uh, cause some issues. Okay, so next question. Which ornamental grass would you recommend in a semi-formal, small, non-irrigated space? And she is looking for something that'll top out around five feet. Um, well, what I would recommend, um, you know, you will have access to this presentation. Um, you will, see, you can always go back to the link, um, which we will have on our YouTube. Um, and I would look at, um, either the switch grasses, uh, so the uh, panicums, um, some of the miscanthus, depending on um, what variety it is. Um, one good website that I would go to, um, there's a Hoffman Nursery. They are located in North Carolina. Now they're a wholesaler uh, and all they produce are liners for the industry to grow these ornamental grasses. Um, but it's a great resource. Uh, they're, they're a great resource. So you can see what the heights would be. And a lot of the growers in this area will purchase from them uh, for their stock plant. So, um, you know, the panicums are gonna have more upright growth. If you want penicetums, you know, they will have more of that, um, the vase shape and, and the foliage is gonna uh, fall out. So, um, you know, it sounds like you have an idea of what your height wants to be, you know, what I would recommend is is look into some of these genus or some of these species and um, see what varieties might hit that height that you're looking for uh, and then go from there. What's the presentation look? Do you want variegation? Do you want, you know, just green foliage? Do you want white flowers? Do you want pink flowers? And then you can make your choice that way. Um, you know, it's almost like a box of Crayola crayons. You, you got a lot to choose from. You've got to do a little bit of digging. You got to do a little bit of, uh, you know, background work in order to find uh, the variety or varieties that might fit uh, what you're looking for. Okay, okay. Paul. Uh, sure. So um, this is definitely a question for you. It says, please spell, uh, I think it's centanium or centanium. Cetacium. The Cetacium. Yeah. Cetacium, so yeah. It's a penicetum, and I believe it is S E T, so set, and then A, and then C E U M. Okay. And that is it. I I, I just won the spelling bee contest. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, other questions? Um, so it looks like one just popped up. It says is lemongrass can uh, Kembogoum citrite considered an ornamental grass. Would you use it in the landscape? Uh, uh, isn't it, it, it? If you want it as an ornamental, you can use it as an ornamental. Uh, I know a lot of people use lemongrass um, for the herb. You know, for they, they'll cut it, they'll dry it, um, <laughs> or or even they can use it fresh. Um, but yeah, th don't be afraid to incorporate those edibles into the landscape because it's even going to give you some ornamental interest. So by all means, uh, I am one that um, 
you know, experiment with it. Try it out. Maybe it works in one spot, it doesn't. Or if you don't like it where it's at, you know, you can always lift it out after a year or two or do a division and move it someplace else. Uh, but don't be afraid to, um, you know, to incorporate, especially the, these edibles and something like uh, lemongrass that has that grass-like look, um, you know, into the landscape and uh, enjoy it and see how it works. Okay. Um, very good. All right, Paul, some uh, one question says uh, or comment. None of these descriptions have zones on them. I'm um, zone six A through five B. How many of these will work? Uh, OK, well, you know, we we do focus for for uh, the Houston area here, but I would think again, if you look at that site, a lot of these are North American natives um, and they will perform in the colder regions. Um, so like that Napier grass or sometimes that uh, Penicetum cetaceum, if you are up in Dallas and you, you know, you guys get much colder than we do, they are definitely going to get knocked out and probably not going to come back the following year. But everything else on that list um, should pretty much, um, I'm thinking quickly if there's anything that might not, I think pretty much most of that other material will hold up uh, if you get frost and freezes and things like that. Again, do a little bit of background work. Um, you know, uh, Hoffman Nursery, another one is Emerald Coast Growers. Um, they do, they produce a lot of these plugs. Again, you, you won't be able to purchase from them, um, but they're great resources and you can find out um, the zones and, and heights and things like that. Okay, no more questions. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed these, um, the new platform that we were working on. We had some minor bugs, but, um, you know, we'll get that worked out and um, um, we'll see you back here uh, next week uh, when we'll be talking about um, earth kind landscape practices. So everybody have a good day, have a good week, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Thank you.